Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Morad Hamid. Um, he, uh, this is our 18th lecture in the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics uh, lecture series on trauma, violence, and um, surgery. And uh, it's hard to believe it's been 18 lectures already in the series. And I, I hope that many in the room and those who will video stream and see them later um, are having enriched on this journey of the University of Chicago Medicine becoming an adult trauma center. So without further uh, delay, Dr. Murad Hamid comes to us from uh, by way of Vancouver, uh, but he's actually in, in many ways an international uh, traveling citizen of the world. Uh, Dr. Hamid completed uh, medical school and residency training at the University of Alberta uh, before heading to the far south of Miami to do trauma and critical care fellowship at uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital and then uh, migrating north to Boston to do his Master of Public Health at Harvard before rising in the ranks at Vancouver General Hospital, uh, where he's now uh, the Division Chief of General Surgery, and having before that been the Division Chief of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery, um, and before that the Program Director of Vancouver General Hospital. So he is um, indeed invested in the far northwest, one of the great cities in the world that I had the benefit of being a visiting professor at under Dr. Hamid's uh, tutelage over a decade ago. Dr. Hamid, uh, um, his research focus is on uh, an intersection of healthcare informatics, information technology, surgical disparities, and trauma systems. And he is going to give us a uh, very um, compelling talk with um, I got. I got to say, how many people from Vancouver start a talk with Tupac? Uh, I don't know where this is going, uh, but the future of injury control is precise, and uh, I hope that we can learn something from this limiting talk. So we've given him a chance to think about the biathlon. He went from running now he has to slow down his heart rate to giving this lecture. So. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Selwyn, for that incredibly generous introduction, and thank you for your friendship and uh, mentorship uh, all these years. If uh, I had sound right now, you would uh, be uh, hearing uh, uh, one of my favorite songs by uh, Tupac Shakur. So just uh, imagine life goes on in the background. Um, it's awe-inspiring for me to be invited here and to have an opportunity to spend some time with you all. As Dr. Rogers mentioned, I'm a trauma surgeon, but not an ethicist or a philosopher. My field, or our field, is one in which decades and centuries of experience and judgment have organized into established protocols and clear algorithms. It is a field with a universal language and closed-loop communication of seamless teamwork and precise flow when a patient comes to our doors, shot in the chest with barely measurable vital signs, we can afford to be cool because the protocols and the conventions of our profession kick in and coast us through. We can establish wide bore IV access, intubate and place bilateral chest tubes. We can shoot and interpret x-rays and perform point of care fast ultrasound exams to detect bleeding and to direct our next actions. We can even open a chest in a few seconds to release and control bleeding often with only a few fleeting clues to go on. We can do all of these things without much thought or reflection. Daniel Kahneman, the winner of the 2002 Nobel Prize for his work on behavioral economics, describes fast and effortless thinking based on pattern recognition and automatic analysis. It skims the surface of the world, often moving us along well-trodden paths forward. It is useful, but Dr. Kahneman points out it is prone to oversimplification and bias. Then there's slow thinking, thinking that requires presence, awareness, effort. This is a thinking that dives deep and soars and that often changes the world. In preparing this talk, I was reminded that I probably gravitated to trauma surgery for this exact reason, to take shelter in the near certainty of protocols and algorithms and to avoid the pain and struggle and effort of thinking deeply. I am in awe of this uh, lecture series that has given focus to ethics. And uh, of all the speakers in the lecture series that preceded me, and by those that will follow me, and by all of you who have committed yourselves to this struggle of effortful thinking 
uh, and to creating the principles that will shape the future of medicine and surgery in public health. Thank you for doing this. So with that, I conclude my remarks. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I wish it could be so easy for all of us. But the only reason that I get to be here today is because of my friendship with Dr. Rogers. About seven or eight years ago, Dr. Rogers accepted our invitation to be our visiting professor at the University of British Columbia General Surgery Resident Research Day. He, of course, brought the house down with a keynote address with his thoughtful assessments of our research programs and by his compassion and warmth. In the afternoon, we went for a walk along English Bay, seen here, and stopped to reflect about our careers and about our duties to our profession. It was an inspiring moment. Since then, he's been a great role model and champion for me. Every so often, I get uh, a, a message from him out of the blue about how I am moving forward and why I haven't been promoted yet. I suspect that I might be getting another email like that soon. The reason that I know Selwyn is because of Susan Krajewski uh, and because of one of the best papers that I've ever had the privilege of being involved with. Susan was a surgical resident at the University of British Columbia who during her training did a master's degree in public health at Harvard with Selwyn. She connected us in a joint study of the Canadian and US health systems. She decided to focus on a typically surgical problem, acute appendicitis. And she hypothesized that the chance of having an attack of appendicitis that proceeded all the way to perforation would be higher in patients with low socioeconomic status. Using an elegant analysis of national inpatient sample data and Canadian Institutes for, uh, of Health Information data, Susan discovered that the risk of perforation was higher in low socioeconomic status patients, regardless of the metric to use uh, to measure SES, and that included income, uh, insurance status, education, and even race. But this finding applied only in the US. In Canada, the story was different. Um, in Canada, there was no correlation between perforation and SES risk. It was an interesting study that was published during the height of the healthcare debates in the US and that made us all reflect on health system design. Most importantly, it was my introduction to Dr. Rogers and to the steady, unrelenting, and idealistic struggle to identify and address disparities in access to health care. By the way, we also found that uh, Canadian perforation rates, although not related to socioeconomic status, were overall higher than those in the US, which was a reminder that these issues are never totally straightforward. Dr. Krajewski's study made some interesting connections, like between the Canadian and US healthcare systems, or perforation rates and socioeconomic status. But it also made clear the connection between the experience of individual surgical patients and surgeons and the experience of entire populations. For surgeons, it is tempting and easy to focus on the suffering of individual patients and on the anatomic and physiologic principles and the protocols and algorithms that we know alleviate the suffering. It is rewarding to repair wounds or get at the source of sepsis and to help restore patients to independence and to the pursuit of their dreams. But does this work really get to the deeper sources of suffering? And as surgeons or trauma care providers, is it our duty to slow down and think deeply to get to this source? Is it our duty to bridge the gap between the care of individuals and the care of societies? Dr. Rogers asked me to prepare a talk examining ethical considerations in violence, trauma, and trauma surgery. In preparing these remarks, I read the Canadian Medical Association Code of Ethics, um, and I'm embarrassed to say for the first time, uh, to see uh, if we are guided in balancing our duties to patients and to society. So the, uh, the CMA code recognizes that, quote, physicians may experience tension between different ethical principles, between ethical and legal or regulatory requirements, or between their own ethical convictions and the demands of other parties. After, after that disclaimer about the tension between um, ethical priorities, uh, guess what the very first fundamental responsibility is in that code of ethics? Does anyone want to take a guess? Matt? Canadian? <laughs> the, uh, the, the very first principle uh, in, um, in the CMA code of ethics is consider first the well-being of the patient. Our patients, need, uh, our patients needs come before our own. When I was a trauma fellow at the University of Miami, one of my attendings, Nick Namias, gave me a pearl that has guided me throughout my life since then. Whenever you find yourself in the middle of the night, torn between two options and looking after your patient, 
always pick the option that is more personally inconvenient for you. It really works. I never thought of Dr. Namias as a medical ethicist, but in preparing this talk, I found that he is. Further down, the code goes on to say, recognize that community, society, and the environment are important factors in the health of individual patients. And it also says, recognize the profession's responsibility to society in matters relating to public health, health education, environmental protection, legislation affecting the health or well-being of the community. And finally, it says, use health resources prudently. I decided to focus my thoughts today on the intersection between individual and society in the context of injury control. There are so many exciting things happening right now in acute care and in public health. Is there a trade-off between them? As trauma care for individuals gets more sophisticated and more complex, especially as, as it moves into the resource-intensive realms of predictive and precision medicine, does it distract us from our duties to our larger communities and societies? As someone who has lived at the front lines of care of individual patients, I have always wondered about how to reconcile high-tech care with the unchecked hardships, hardships of people in our own communities and those around the world. It's certainly tempting to continue to focus on achieving excellence in the care of our patients. Our knowledge is better. Our technology, driven by market forces, is more capable of achieving miracles. Um, and. Uh, 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 and uh, our healthcare is more integrated than ever before. The exciting thing is that we're on the threshold of another phase of exponential growth of knowledge and, and capability. The sequencing of the human genome, um, a, phenomena, a phenomenal achievement that one, once cost close to a billion dollars, is now available for about a thousand dollars. And it will touch off a new era of precision medicine in which diagnostics and therapeutics will be uniquely targeted to individuals and in which efficacy of therapies will be high and side effects low. This explosion of knowledge has taken place in parallel with literally exponential growth in computing power, data storage and integration capacity, and data analytics, speed and sophistication that has been governed by Moore's law that uh, our computing capacity doubles every year. Better computing power will make it possible to link genomic data with clinical data, to make new connections between investigators, clinicians, and patients, and to create new insights and new breakthroughs for increasingly specific and precise problems. Precision medicine has captured the imagination of the medical community with unprecedented public and private investment and a national initiative launched in 2010 by President Obama to bring the right therapies to the right patient at the right time, every time. Um, precision medicine, which is identified uh, uh, as uh, uh, exactly as uh, President Obama said, the right therapies to the right patient at the right time, every time, uh, using advanced technologies, including genomics and um, computing power, um, is the direction in which our commitment to the care of our individual patients will lead. It's exciting, and it's hard to admit that precision medicine, as transformational as it is, is unlikely to significantly change the health of our society. The returns on investment in healthcare are already diminishing. In the US, healthcare costs are high and continue to rise every year. In Canada, the story is the very same. And there have been some landmark studies, both in the UK and the United States, that show that advances in medical care rarely move the needle on uh, population health in general. Critics of precision medicine argue that investments in precision medicine might be better directed toward public health. If we could somehow identify everyone in the United States, for example, that could benefit for intervention for current tier one precision medicine recommendations, and that is uh, screening for patients with the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations who um, respectively have a 65 and 45 percent risk, uh, lifetime risk of breast cancer, or people who have Lynch syndrome uh, with the DNA mismatch repair mutations, or who have familial hypercholesterolemia, those four conditions account for only about 2 million people in the United States. Meanwhile, public health measures promoting healthy eating, active living, blood pressure reduction, smoking sensation, cessation, and injury control have the potential to touch, touch the lives of literally, literally billions of people around the world, probably with greater cost effectiveness than precision medicine. 
So you can see the tension begin to develop between precision medicine or individual directed care and population-based care. Focusing on trauma, uh, the story of how society confronted trauma as a public health crisis is a good one. In the 1960s, um, it was an era of steady urbanization and urban sprawl, industrialization, escalations in road traffic, apparent income inequality and civil unrest. Many cities in North America and around the world were seeing unprecedented volumes of injury. An example was Baltimore, a city with burglary, assault, and homicide rates many times above the national average. Amazingly, no one in public health or healthcare viewed uh, this advancing epidemic injury as a problem. But the publication of the National Academy of Sciences' Accidental Death and Disability, The Neglected Disease of Modern Society in 1966, marked a major turning point in our approach to injury control. Their statement that the public apathy to the mounting toll from accidents must be transformed into an action program under strong leadership inspired a generation of surgeons to do just that, transforming the way society confronts injury. In fact, according to Avery Nathans, uh, who's coming here in a few weeks, um, surgeons returning home from wars in Korea and Vietnam with their organizational and technical skills honed in combat and the college advocating reform and improvements of standards at home gained a preeminent role in the care of injured patients. Perhaps no one gained as preeminent a role as R. Adams Cowley. Dr. Cowley was a, re a, rel a relentless innovator whose contributions led to the development of trauma's golden hour concept. He developed dedicated shock and trauma units, dedicated trauma centers, military-style helicopter emergency medical services, and statewide emergency medical systems. Every one of these ideas spread across the world and disrupted the status quo and transformed the way we approach trauma and, to some extent, other forms of critical illness. Dr. Cowley and others developed the concept of systems of trauma care, an organized public health approach based on the constant collection and analysis of data that spans prevention, pre-hospital care, acute trauma care, and rehabilitation. In business terms, these principles disrupted healthcare and public health, creating new paradigms of data-driven and systematic approaches to a dangerous, pervasive, but ultimately modifiable problem. In trauma, there's nothing more important than the system, and the trends have been remarkable. Since 1966, mortality from unintentional injury in the U.S. has fallen from, five, uh, from 55 per 100,000 population in 1965 to 37.7 per 100,000 in 2004. As innovative energy pre uh, injury prevention strategies uh, have been broadly implemented and access to sophisticated trauma care within an hour of injury has been provided to 84.1% uh, of all Americans. So uh, that's a large part of the American population that's covered by access to definitive trauma care. When the burden of injury is shared between acute hospitals and inclusive and integrated systems of trauma care, outcomes get even better. The most inclusive tra of trauma systems uh, have shown the lowest odds of mortality uh, with about a 23% reduction in mortality when trauma centers are working well and working together. Uh, in a Canadian study, the development of an inclusive system of trauma care uh, where the efforts of level one and level three trauma centers were closely integrated on a provincial level, patient mortality was observed to fall uh, to its lowest level in 10 years. I've heard trauma surgeons say that the biggest advance in trauma care in the past four decades is the development of systems. But probably the most important question is, what has been the public health impact of over five decades of trauma systems development? We've been doing well with trauma systems development, but the truth is that 5.1 million people still die of injuries every year. And uh, as all of you know, uh, injury is the fourth leading cause of death and uh, morbidity uh, in, um, in North America, and it's the leading cause of potential years of life lost. The fact is that despite all these advances, trauma is still the world's number one cause of potential years of life lost. People in low, middle in low and middle income countries sustain a disproportionate burden of injury. Of all deaths worldwide, 89% of trauma deaths occur in low and middle income countries as compared to 84% from all causes. Injuries account for 12% of deaths in low and middle income countries, but only 6% in high income countries. The problem of injury is especially bad in Africa, where injury is the second overall leading cause of disability and death. As you might know, 
um, Africa, with one of the lowest motorization rates, already has a high rate of road traffic mortality. Both African and South America, both Africa and South America face high rates of mortality from interpersonal violence. And even in Dr. Cowley's city, Baltimore, the impact of poverty, education, race, or geography on injury risk remains breathtakingly high. Despite all the progress in trauma systems, last year Baltimore hit an all-time high in homicide with startlingly high vulnerability among African Americans. Public health approaches to injury control may be beginning to fail, actually. In addition to glaring residual disparities, <coughs> even the successes may be starting to level off. Motor vehicle crash fatalities, for example, which are often reported as deaths per 100,000 miles driven, may seem to be declining because most commuters um, must endure miles and miles of stop and go bumper to bumper traffic. So at low velocity, uh, mortality from motor vehicle crashes um, could be underreported if we measure it per 100,000 miles traveled. In this case, the indicator injury burden may be flawed. I am aware that at the moment I am standing uh, in the city that is the birthplace of trauma systems, speaking to the people who know more about the burden of injury than I will ever know. Here, it's estimated that 39,000 people have been killed in the past six decades, and that the number of murders has not fallen significantly, despite increasingly capable trauma centers and trauma systems. So how good we are at uh, resuscitating and operating on trauma patients uh, is in some ways masking the heavy burden of, uh, of uh, violence that our society faces. So we've seen, uh, so what's the solution if public health is beginning, beginning to level off in its impact or even if it's beginning to fail? Well, we've seen increasingly complex and sophisticated systems of diagnosis and treatment and escalating healthcare expenditure set in the midst of a stormy and unrelenting pandemic. What is our duty and where do we go from here? How do we further optimize the performance of trauma systems? How do we create new disruption and transformation in injury control? I think that injury control, and by that I mean injury prevention and systematic trauma care, is at the threshold of a second major disruption. And I think that the engine of this disruption lies at the point of interaction between patients and the healthcare system, the same place from where precision medicine takes flight. Now, for the first time, trauma systems are poised to embrace the diversity and complexity of this patient healthcare system interaction and to gain deeper insights from every aspect of that interaction. In 1970, basically at the dawn of modern trauma systems, um, William Haddon, uh, a physician and graduate of MIT, Harvard Medical School, and the Harvard School of Public Health, and an administrator at the National Traffic, uh, National Traffic Safety Agency, described a framework to understand the determinants of injury risk. The Haddon matrix characterizes motor vehicle crashes, for example, into phases, pre-crash, crash, and post-crash. And within each phase, risk can be thought of as being governed by human factors, vehicle and equipment factors, and environmental factors. Violence-related injury can also be conceptualized in this framework as having pre-event, event, and post-event phases, with human vector and environmental determinants acting in each phase. The matrix organizes determinants to give us insights about where there may be opportunities for action. Some determinants may be more modifiable than others. The exciting thing is, uh, that modification of even one or two determinants or risk factors could completely change the implications of a traumatic event or prevent it altogether. Wouldn't it be amazing to build an actionable Haddon matrix for every trauma patient and every at-risk population? To do this, we might focus on the point of trauma care, the moment that unites injured patients with healthcare teams. The point of trauma care is fascinating, in part because it brings together a patient previously completely unknown with unknown pattern and severity of injury, with a diverse and multidisciplinary team, possibly just assembled moments before, at a moment of crisis. It's a perfect storm, and even though it falls back on algorithms and protocols, and patients and teams must navigate a sea of data and make the most consequential and life-changing decisions with incomplete information and with uncertainty. The arrival of, of a patient in the trauma bay touches off a series of processes, both diagnostic and therapeutic, each of which generates waves of data about anatomic injury, physiologic state, and response to resuscitation, but also about individual patient factors like age, um, uh, comorbidity, and about the social determinants of health. 
Each patient then, and each interaction with the system, creates a complex, multidimensional data set of anatomic, physiologic, social, and environmental information that has the potential to uniquely influence the way we understand trauma and care specifically uh, for our trauma patients and, injury, and to perform injury control more broadly. I chose to open this lecture with Tupac's song, uh, Life Goes On, because um, hip hop was the way um, that the duty of clinicians to society was introduced to me. Uh, when I was a graduate student in public health, and that's like about 20 years ago, uh, the professor in my urban violence class opened the first lecture with hip hop. The class listened spellbound. The frustration and hopelessness and tragic implications of violence were clear in the words. The professor, Dr. Deborah Prothrow Stith, who patched up trauma patients in the emergency department herself, only to send them back out into dangerous environments, encouraged us all to use our frontline perspectives on injury to drive action on the social determinants of health. I returned to Canada for my trauma fellowship and public health training, inspired to engage with the social determinants of injury, injury risk and outcome. Our work benefited from the strong history of trauma system design and development. We already had a regional uh, system of uh, trauma care, organized multidisciplinary trauma centers, and most exciting to me, access to data in trauma registries. Um, does anybody here use trauma registry data in, in their research? No one? Trauma registries uh, have placed trauma systems development on a strong foundation of data, and they're considered to be so essential that their presence is an essential part of trauma accreditation. To get accredited by the American College of Surgeons, uh, trauma systems have to show that they're collecting data. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, in awe of the early architects of trauma systems for having the foresight to build this foundation of data. While we owe much of our knowledge about uh, injury to trauma registries, we also found that registries have limitations. Um, the, uh, the high cost and quality uh, of data acquisition means that the number of fields are limited and not easily adapted to day-to-day -day needs. Most trauma registries have about a three to six month lag between the time the data is collected uh, and the time it's analyzed, which diminishes the agility and the impact of registry data. Insightful quality improvement in research often requires linkages uh, between trauma registries and other sources of data, and linkage is limited by administrative and logistical issues, the quality of data, and other databases. Trauma registries, like all registries, can only answer the questions that they were designed to answer. And for the most part, they were not designed to answer questions on the social determinants of health. But despite these limitations, registry data are still very exciting. In an early study using registry data, we linked uh, we link the registry to Canadian federal data on Aboriginal status. Since healthcare coverage uh, in Canada is a federal mandate, um, the, um, the uh, healthcare numbers of uh, Aboriginal Canadians have a unique identifier that indicates that federal linkage. So through linking registry data with uh, data on ethnicity, we found that status Aboriginal Canadians had a four times greater risk for motor vehicle crash related injury and an 11 times greater risk for violence related injury. 11 times risk. The findings quantified enormous disparities in the burden of injury in the Canadian context. At the time, it was important news that triggered consultations and deliberations within the leadership of local Aboriginal bands. We did a series of studies in uh, metropolitan Vancouver um, with my, my research partner, Professor Nadine Sherman from the Department of Geography at Simon Fraser University. Um, and, uh, we, what we did is we linked trauma registry data uh, to techniques of data visualization anal and analysis from geographic information systems. So we took injury data from the registry and basically mapped it to the city. And you'll see the map come up uh, uh, soon. Um, uh, and um, uh, what we found was uh, there were high-risk neighborhoods and social gradients for violence-related injury, um, just like Dr. Prothrow pred predicted that we would find. If any of you have been to Vancouver, anyone been to Vancouver? Oh, a few have been. Great. Um, so you'll remember that it's a high population density city with high pedestrian and automobile traffic in close proximity. Pedestrian trauma often results in devastating high energy in injuries, and we decided to use registry data and GIS to try to understand its determinants and to populate Haddon's matrix a bit better. Our analysis revealed a single street, East Hastings Street, 
at the heart of Canada's poorest postal code in the downtown east side of the city, where every single intersection lit up as a hotspot for injury. The study was published, and as far as we knew, the insight was lost. But the amazing thing about this story is that somehow the data and the images were picked up by a local advocacy group, advocacy group the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users. And those data, those data and the maps were used to lobby um, the, city, uh, the city to institute changes to the built environment along the corridor. The study actually resulted in speed limits and traffic calming measures along East Hastings, and anecdotally, fewer pedestrian injuries there. The story is one of my favorite examples of how simple analysis of the social determinants, in this case neighborhood, have the potential to support uh, the advocates of policy change with real data that populates Haddon's matrix. We took our excitement about the potential of trauma registries to one of my favorite places in the world, Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, as we've seen, South, African, uh, South Africa continues to face an enormous burden of injury, both intentional and non-intentional. Projects such as the National Injury Mortality Surveillance System have used mortuary-based data to capture injury-related deaths based on glo uh, the global burden of injury classifications. For 2007, that system recorded 33,484 injury-related deaths. More than one-third of those were due to violence, followed by traffic injuries at 32%, other injuries uh, at 13%, and undetermined uh, suicide at 10%, and undetermined causes at 8.8%. Although trending downward, the murder rate in South Africa is still 30.9 per 100,000 population, um, and that's uh, 4.5 times the global average. The escalating rate of traffic-related deaths, 33.2 per 100,000 in 2011, suggests the need for proportionate research efforts surrounding prevention and education. Grutuskir Hospital at the University of Cape Town is one of the most clinically and academically productive trauma centers in the world, and one of two hubs in an inclusive trauma system in the Western Cape. When we got there in 2005, we found that because of extremely high volumes and cost, they were unable to prioritize the creation of a trauma registry. Almost all of their research, mainly case reviews, was done on paper, and there was no outreach into the surrounding communities that were generating waves upon waves of trauma for the trauma center. They were literally too busy to collect data on the massive uh, volumes of trauma that were coming through the door. Together with the director uh, of the Crew to Skier Trauma Unit, Professor Andrew Nickel, we embarked on the process of creating a trauma registry there from scratch. We surveyed clinical and public health leaders uh, for what fields they wanted collected and embedded these fields in a paper admission record uh, that their residents were asked to complete as part of clinical documentation. So when patients would come in, instead of uh, writing um, on, a, uh, on a blank sheet of paper, they would fill out a, a paper a trauma record. Um, we designed the form with a carbon copy backing that we would eventually collect, um, uh, enter into a database and analyze. The form launched successfully and we went home. About a year passed before we could go back. And uh, by then we had stopped hearing about the form and assumed that it wasn't being used anymore. Uh, on the first day back when I greeted uh, Dr. Nichols' uh, uh, assistant, um, she said to me, um, what I wanted to do, what did I want to do with the papers? Um, I didn't actually get her meeting. It was so long before that I, I didn't even know what she's talking about. I said, what papers? She looked at me incredulously. You know, the papers everyone has been collecting and bringing to me day after day. She led us around the corner to a small cove and to our surprise and excitement, we saw piled from desk to ceiling, um, three stacks of registry forms. It, and it was a tall ceiling that they were stacked to. We had to take the piles back to our hotel in several trips, and eventually the forms were entered into Excel, uh, a process that took two grad students three months. Although there were a lot of missing fields, we had over 9,000 records. It was one of the biggest trauma registries in Africa at the time. Around that time, Apple released the iPad mini, and we had the idea to migrate our paper form to a digital user interface. This insight led to the development of Ether, the electronic trauma health record. So if you remember that this talk is about precision medicine and public health, you may be able to see where I'm going with the story. Ether had remarkable uptake and ran at Grutuskir for three years, collecting admission, surgical, and discharge data, and generating in real time an electronic trauma registry of almost 30,000 patients. 
There's a paper coming out in JAMA Surgery today in which we report that the electronic forms were, were user-friendly enough to fill out as fast as paper with field completion rates that jumped from 35% to 95% in the ether era and with high user satisfaction, 88% of clinicians entering data at the point of care preferred using an iPad-based digital documentation tool to paper. We made a lot of assumptions in building a clinician-entered real-time electronic trauma registry. And one of the big assumptions that we made is that when physicians or clinicians enter data at the point of care, that the data will be of high enough quality that people can do analysis on it. And that was a big gamble at the time because most registries are collected by professional uh, data abstractors. Um, but what we found was that the data entered into a usable interface standardized by drop-down menus, um, enters into the background database complete, already organized, and for the most part ready for analysis. We used the data to model survival predictions using multivariate models and even machine learning techniques. And we found that the predictions generated by, by clinician-entered data at the point of care created better predictions than data that were da better or as good predictions as data collected manually uh, by professional data abstractors. The implication here is important, that data generated at the point of care in real time and entered by clinicians during the course of clinical work could be used to provide insights about the trauma system and by extension to engage frontline clinicians more broadly with the social determinants of health. For the first time, clinicians at Hootiskir Hospital could see maps generated from the data that they entered of the distribution of injury in their city. And you'll see some of those maps. Since then, We've taken this work a lot further, exploring the implications of using digital technology at the point of care to inform systems development and public health. We've been deeply influenced by the, by the work of Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Uh, Dr. Deming was a mathematician, physicist, and statistician who uh, presented a paper in Japan in 1950 uh, to a group of industrialists about a, uh, a discipline called statistical process control. Um, and um, what Dr. Deming said, and you can imagine Japan in 1950 was, uh, uh, it's sort of in a, it's, its economy was in a post-war ruins. Uh, there's not much industry going on. And so the industrialists were eager to hear what uh, uh, a st statistical process control analyst would say to them. And what Dr. Deming said is that any complex process in manufacturing can be broken down into a set of small discrete steps. And within each step, you can measure variability. Now, there's natural variability, and there's uh, also unexpected variation. And by reducing unexpected variation along this process, um, Dr. Deming reasoned that you could actually control uh, for the output of the process and not even have to measure its quality. The act of controlling the process controls the quality. And guess what happened uh, in Japan after that? Japanese manufacturing took off, was uh, noted to be highly reliable, and uh, Japanese automakers making the same car and the same model as U.S. automakers actually had, um, um, had better results. And the reason was uh, tolerating uh, less variation during the process. Um, and the example that, uh, that, uh, that I read is that if you have a, a part that's, say, supposed to be a foot long, and um, uh, the, the Japanese would tolerate 1 16th inch of a variation, uh, but the Americans would tolerate 1 8th of an inch. Um, those type of variations add up, and uh, uh, car consumers would actually notice uh, a difference in the quality of the product. So once data starts to be mapped like this in real time, you can start to get a true uh, uh, feeling for the, the microscopic steps in a process. This work was adapted to, to healthcare by Avidis Donabedian, a Lebanese and American University uh, and, and a Harvard-trained uh, physician and public health scholar who developed the structure process outcome framework that we use to understand and evaluate healthcare systems today. According to Dr. Donabedian, the measurement of process is nearly equivalent to the measurement of quality of care because process contains all acts of healthcare delivery. So again, simply by documenting your, uh, your patient experience well, you have a chance to impact the entire system of healthcare delivery. We've seen um, t healthcare teams coalesce around this digital technology and use it as a platform for communication and as a forum for collaboration. We've also incorporated the work of Michael Porter from the Harvard Business School on time-driven activity-based costing. 
what Dr. Porter advocates for is to take these processes, break them down into microscopic steps, and then to go one step further, link those steps to costs so that you can then begin to estimate the true cost of healthcare. Um, so again, by, by bringing uh, digital technology, one can start to integrate uh, even cost data and start to get an idea not only of the cost, but also the value of healthcare. And we've also used point of care data to understand the contextual factors that surround injury using clinician entered data to capture demographics and comorbidity <clears throat> and GIS techniques to visualize the determinants and the social burden of injury. This work joins a whole movement to link the point of clinical care to the health of the population. I know that Dr. Marie Crandall spoke here a few, year, a few weeks ago on geographic information science applications and injury control. And uh, every other speaker and all of you have thought broadly and deeply about these issues. I know that Dr. Rogers and Dr. Hampton are working with Dr. Sherman to map violence-related injury here in Chicago. This work will be essential both in planning of healthcare resource allocation, such as uh, deployment to paramedics and trauma center activity, but also to begin to understand how the social determinants interact to create and perhaps prevent injury risk. What I'm most excited about, though, is the way um, all of you are, are designing uh, the trauma system in Chicago uh, um, from the ground up. Uh, we have uh, one of the oldest and best uh, trauma centers in the world at Cook County, and now the Chicago Trauma, uh, the Chicago trauma Center um, is coming up based um, as a hub for community engagement. Watching Dr. Rogers uh, and your teams bring this idea of trauma as a public health issue uh, into reality has been a highlight of my career. Um, we have the potential to learn from every patient that comes through your doors. And by thoughtfully considering the tip of the iceberg, that is patients who are injured enough to come to the trauma center, we can better understand the way the entire iceberg is affecting and disrupting the lives and the communities that surround us. This thoughtful consideration is and will be driven by better and more multidimensional and higher resolution data. There are some pitfalls with this emphasis on data collection and analysis. There is the issue of uh, privacy and security. Healthcare data is sensitive and has the potential to affect employment, insurability, and autonomy. This is a concern that must be met with the greatest care. Strategies to protect and de-identify data are already well known and must be weighed against the collective utility of clinical and public health insights that can be derived from the linkage and analysis of big, high-resolution data sets. The cost of continuous high-volume data collection analysis is also not trivial. Development and maintenance of technology and the serial analytics that are required to drive culture change are labor-intensive and expensive. In many instances, this work has required public-private partnerships where private contributions are profit-driven. Who owns the data in these cases and in what form? And what can people use the data for? These are questions for this and subsequent generations of ethicists whose work and continuous presence will be uh, needed more and more. So I've spoken for a long time and I'm so grateful to all of you for listening to these stories. We've grappled with injury as a public health crisis forever, but I think that for the first time in five decades, we have an opportunity to disrupt the status quo with uh, technology uh, from the point of care like this. Moving forward with injury control, in my opinion, depends on the reduction of disparities in the determinants of health and in the promotion of social justice. This means detailed attention to the interplay of age, race, language, gender, comorbidity, education, income, occupation, geography, housing stability, and a spectrum of other factors that impact individuals and communities in the pre-event, event, and post-event phases of the continuum of trauma care. To do this may require diverse input and a willingness to embrace and address complexity. This is where I believe synergies with precision medicine will become useful. Precision medicine and precision public health are, in my opinion, complementary strategies. From precision medicine, public health can adapt approaches to data collection, storage, security, linkage, and analysis. It can target primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention policy to specific segments of diverse populations where they can be expected to have the most impact and benefit. From public health, precision medicine can learn that genetic data must be linked to specific knowledge of the environment and of social determinants in order to have a true impact on society. It can remember to be inclusive in its selection of cohort populations and in the dissemination of its findings and therapies. Technology and analytics are not, 
in and of themselves the solution to better healthcare systems. According to Dr. Donavidian, systems awareness and systems design are important for health professionals, but are not enough. They are enabling mechanisms only. It is the ethical dimension of individuals that is essential to a system's success. Ultimately, the secret of quality is love. It's an exciting time right now when technological revolutions can be applied to make meaningful improvements in societal health. I think uh, that the apparent tension between individual and societal duties mentioned in the CMA can be resolved if we constantly recognize that what we see on the front lines of trauma is an individual and a societal issue. In the words of Martin Luther King, uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Or from Rosemary Brown, a Canadian politician, until all of us have made it, none of us has made it. In the age of big data, these words are more relevant and exciting than ever. I'll leave with uh, Dr. Cowling's comment, uh, which, uh, which has been a guiding force in the evolution of trauma systems. Every critically ill or injured person has the right to the best medical care according to the state of the art and not according to location, severity of injury, or ability to pay. Um, in this defining comment, he combines both the notion of the state of the art and the duty to society. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Mead, for that uh, incredibly insightful talk. I actually, th there's this tension, as you, as you know, between individual and public health especially in the context of the patient-doctor relationship. Individual surgeon, individual nurse taking care of an individual with patient. How do you juxtapose that tension, thinking about resources, the importance of attention to the individual patient, but then being able to drift back and see the big picture, if you will? Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Uh, absolutely. Um, there's a tension between caring for individual patients versus um, uh, versus groups of patients or versus society. And uh, w what I've noticed is that healthcare has become so complex now that it even takes many providers to care for one patient. So it, the environment's getting more complex. It's getting more disconnected. Um, Patients don't feel that they have physicians. Physicians don't feel responsible specifically to individual patients, let alone to, um, to society. Um, so I think this complexity is, is, uh, getting, is, is kind of putting in us in some ways at a distance from our patients. Um, I think the solution to this is, um, is better design of, of systems. Um, and I'm noticing that um, even in our division of general surgery, the residents are always swamped with uh, a million different commitments and to trying to interact with a multidisciplinary team and always falling short of in these types of communications and spending less and less time with their patients. Um, so what we're trying to do actually is standardize our work as much as possible. So th thinking about um, the, the work that comes from manufacturing. If there's a process that can be standardized, can be automated, uh, can be done with a very little cognitive investment, we'll try to standardize and automate that process. And it really results in sort of a, um, a manufacturing um, uh, a, a kind of ethos in medicine, which I think clinicians tend to resist because we all value independence and creativity. But I actually think that if you, what, what you standardize and if you can use technology to standardize a few things, it actually frees your um, cognitive capacity to be more creative on top of that. So it's like taking care of the fundamentals um, automatically, and then on top of that, building creativity. So I guess so it's a rambling answer, but the short answer would be that um, I think that uh, healthcare systems have to um, uh, simplify and organize, um, and ultimately to create more opportunity for <coughs> clinicians to interact with individual patients. Because I think that's why we all why we all went into this. I'd be invited to a chair. We're going to take questions and answers, and this uh, he brings his water so he can get his breath. Thank you. No questions? Everything's clear, 
Um, that's a very nice talk. Um, you referenced Don Abedian several times. He's somebody I've been familiar with for you know, close to 40 years at this point. Um, and um, um, his structure process um, leading to outcome paradigm um, is you know, applicable at, um, at sort of a macro level, and it's, it's an enabling paradigm. It's, I don't really see it as something that functions very well at all once you have an individual patient in front of an individual doctor. And the, the thing that I've always liked, or for a long time have liked a lot more, is something that's never gotten um, much in the way of the fame that Don Abedi and her structure process outcome. And it's a paradigm that puts together um, knowledge, the judgment with which it is um, applied and the skill with which it is applied, and that that's something that works a lot better um, at the at the individual you know micro individual patient interaction level. Um, um, when you're talking about systematizing things. Um, <laughs> There are many things that are certainly subject to systemization and checklists and things of that sort. But when you get right down to it with things that are not routine, I think it still gets down to knowledge, judgment, and skill. What would you have to say about that? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great comment, which I, which I agree with. And the knowledge, judgment, skill is, uh, uh, I think, um, the, the qualities of a master. Uh, and it was probably the way that medicine evolved initially. But I think now that we've gone through this phase of industrialization where we're standardizing things so much and we have NISQIP and TQIP and lean processes and so on, uh, now knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge, judgment, and skill probably comes back as a more modern construct. You know, I think that if we standardize some baseline functions of the healthcare system and on top of that layer our knowledge and judgment and skill, I think our patients will be much better off. And, and I'm hoping that clinicians who are less distracted by um, regulatory issues and documentation and things things that may uh, take a lot of their creative time away uh, can then get back to this uh, idea of applying knowledge, uh, judgment and skill uh, and actually have more rewarding careers and achieve better patient outcomes. Um, the, other, the other great thing that you said is that um, something that follows from um, Dr. Porter's work at the Harvard Business School where um, for, for a long time I think we were on, on this Don Obedient track of measuring process as a as a mean, as a mean, as an end in itself, like m just measure process and make it perfect because it's too hard to measure outcomes. Like, what are outcomes anyways? Do we have to measure it ten years out, or do we measure functional dependence, or what measures do we use? But I think we're realizing um, now that um, we, as the processes start to become standardized, we could probably start to measure outcomes again. And with technology um, applications, and now there's so much data, and patients can even report their own data. Um, we probably can start to calibrate our systems of care, our uh, knowledge, judgment, skill uh, to, um, to real outcomes that can be even patient reported. Um, and I think now we can start to move beyond sort of like this manufacturing mode to more of a value mode where are we providing our patients with valuable outcomes. So I think what you said is, is a great comment and a, I think it represents sort of a maybe the next generation of thinking a focus on knowledge, judgment, and skill, and real uh, valuable patient outcomes. And I think technology may in some ways enable this. So the time we talk is injury control. How do we get more precision, given the fact that there is, that data acquisition is so expensive, especially if you push it to the clinicians, the nurses, physicians. That's me. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think data acquisition is expensive, but I think we're now, you know, entering this sort of big data era where a lot of places will be able to generate data. Now, um, we're also developing the analytics tools to separate um, junky data from from uh, good data, and we're also developing more computing power to link data and to analyze it. And so now we have powerful um, uh, computers that can apply machine learning techniques to data and so I think I think we're very good on the data collection side um, and I recently read about a notion called the learning health system and 
if you can imagine, this is a national health uh, services in, in the UK. They talk about this learning health system that perpetually learns from every patient that comes through. And in the learning health system, you imagine a circle, and the circle has this afferent arrow and then an efferent arrow. And the afferent arrow is all the data sources that come into the system. So this is vital signs data, clinical data, EHR data, um, labs, x-rays, and so on, and also patient-reported data. So that's the side where we're really good at getting in, and I think in the modern world with EHRs and all this stuff, we're going to be able to collect massive amounts of data. The problem sometimes is on the, on the action side, on the, on the efferent side, um, how do we get this data to actually change culture and to shift the needle on the quality of our care or the quality of our public health? And I think that's where we're actually starting to get better as well. Um, because we know more about behavior change and the psychology of behavior change than we've known before. Uh, we know no more about the health of neighborhoods, for instance. We, we're knowing more about social determinants of health. So we need um, really smart people on both sides, on the data side, but also on the, on the action side. And the specific question um, about how can we translate that data into action, um, so on is a, I think that's really the mo most important defining question of our careers. And I, I, my hypothesis, and I wonder if you would agree, and I'd actually love to know what all of you think, is that if we're more precise about population health, we might be better at it. So if we know that, you know, uh, seatbelt use in a certain community in the southwest uh, of Arizona is very low, then we can pick up on that and target it. And we can target campaigns specifically to, uh, to seatbelt use in a certain population with a certain readiness for change. And I know that they already do this in, in our democracies, the, the very precision uh, messaging. Um, you know, and similarly, if, um, if, uh, you, if we can even move one predictor of risk in, um, uh, in gun violence, say um, the age of uh, acquisition of, of guns, maybe that would move the needle in a community that has a lot of youth violence with guns. So I'm just thinking that rather than sweeping, we're, we're probably not going to identify sort of sweeping public health strategies to change population health. We're probably going to find more precision strategies. Great. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the example of gun violence because it's the 20th, I mean, it's the one-month anniversary of shooting in Parkland. Uh, one of the things that has struck me about that is that there have been hundreds of thousands of shootings in Chicago and in Baltimore and in Cleveland and so many American cities and we're still working on change and change hasn't happened yet. Dr. Bendix. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I'm one of the trauma faculty here and interested in a lot of the concepts that you've been talking about today. Um, in more granular detail about some of the, the data that you're interested in moving towards in a precision context. Uh, how would you entertain the use of more, let's say, uh, participant observation type of data? You know, some, uh, the, the more subjective components of what a patient tells their physician or the more sort of nuanced aspects and how you've approached that type of data rather than, you know, some of the geospatial um, biomedical metrics um, and how you've interfaced with that type of work, if you have. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks for another great question. Um, well, what I noticed about the geospatial analyses is that it only takes you so far. Like, we've sliced our uh, registry data every way we can and analyzed every possible sort of uh, geographic visualization that we could. Um, but. It, it sometimes doesn't allow us enough insight to actually change things. So that the, we probably have to start to develop these multifaceted strategies, and I think that might mean combining geography from patient-reported or citizen-reported um, uh, uh, data. And um, I know that some of our colleagues in San Francisco, for example, are, are using Twitter data to try to see if there's like hotspots for certain risky behaviors or, or so on. And uh, Twitter data comes in like the billions of data points, like it's massive data. And um, so I think we're just at the threshold of beginning to use sort of crowdsource or citizen reported data. Um, I think where we might be, be more successful early on is patient reported data, so moving closer to the healthcare system. And I think Salman, I'd be interested to know if you're starting to do this here with your trauma patients and families, um, are they filling out surveys in the waiting room or are patients um, 
entering any types of data while they're waiting after surgery. Um, that's, that's perhaps data that might be more immediately analyzable and actionable. And well, we haven't done any of it yet. your brain at dinner, because we're 47 days away from being in the Doug Thomas Center, but maybe I can pivot that to Dr. Kaminsky, who sits in the audience over at Cook County, maybe he can comment. Well, I think we, we know where the guns are from, from Indiana. Uh, we know the hot spots. It's, we're probably walking there, no traffic. <laughs> data and all the information that we know we have, we all know we have a problem. How do you turn that to the politicians and into public policy? Right to the politicians. Have, have, like we're, we're at the table. Uh, how do we do that? You, you did get to the table with them? Well, uh, Region 11, um, they're not necessarily there, but we, we make the decision on system, um, and uh, often the politicians have their view or their, it, it turns into, uh, I guess, politics, or they have a preconceived view of how do you change that. And, and I'm not expecting the answer. Uh, no, no problem, I'll answer that. Uh, I mean, I'm just kidding. Um, it is a billion dollar question. Um, one thing I, I wonder is that in, in 2018, one of the lovely things about data is it's a very, um, uh, democratic force. Um, and so if people possess data uh, at the grassroots, uh, perhaps they'll be more inspired to take action. And um, so any type of data collection, I think, whether it's at the point of care and trauma or whether it's patient reported data, should be as widely accessible as possible. And the problem with registry data is it's collected, nobody sees where it goes, you need ethics approval to get it out, it's going to be a year later before you get it. Uh, you'll have to link it, that's going to take more time, then you'll publish it or present it at a meeting and then it'll be done. So what we need to do is create systems that combine data acquisition with data analytics and data visualization so that non-scientists can see the data uh, as it comes through and interpret it. And often I feel like people on the front lines will be able to provide insights about that data that other people won't. And I, I'm wondering if that type of data can sort of empower um, again, empower citizens to uh, lobby for change. And I noticed today was a big um, rally for gun violence across the U.S. I don't know how, how big it was, I didn't hear, but uh, I think that's ultimately what would have the chance maybe to, um, to uh, make a difference. But I think it would be more powerful if it's linked to real data and evidence. I, I think as mentioned, uh, the subjective side, every tragedy has a story some are very common to uh, the gang members. And honestly, a lot of people don't really care about that. Uh, but there are individuals that are caught in the crossfire, that are caught uh, at a Starbucks. Um, uh, a kid, uh, you know, eight year old child, uh, just a few, few days ago. There's a story behind, behind that. Um, if that subjective data gets captured in a negative data set, uh, translates into Yeah, that's a great point. Other questions? Comments? Dr. Siegel, you get the last word. I wanted to thank you so much for coming and finding your way here. <laughs> going through uh, some of the uh, difficult neighborhoods. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.